So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's really great to be here. Uh, thanks for coming. And um, it's really great to see such an international program, too. My mm. name is Tina. I, um, I'm German, but I've been based in Egypt for the past 17 years now. So I've been working a lot in the, in the MENA region. The program today was supposed to be delivered by my colleague Salma Adri. Um, I don't know if you, I think somebody recommended Salma or has seen Salma. She couldn't make it, unfortunately, so she passed the invitation on to me, which is fantastic because now I get to spend some time in Paris. <laughs> um, so very nice meeting you all. Uh, I'll be talking today about uh, climate security, which is a little bit of a new topic in the, the context of, of climate change, um, but, and also how, what it means for the Arab region, which, as you all know, also is not a very easy region politically, in terms of development, in terms of all sorts of different challenges. So, um, just as a very quick introduction, I work for an institution called CGIAR. So we are actually an international consortium of different research centers. As you can see on the map, there's 15 different research centers all over the world. There's the International Water Management Institute, uh, research, agricultural research in the dry areas. I work for a center that's called the Alliance of Biodiversity and SEAT, and we are kind of partially based in Rome and partially in Colombia. Um, and it's, it's a really international kind of consortium of different centers. They're all working on food, land and water systems more broadly and how to kind of generate more food security throughout the world, specifically within a context of a changing global climate. And the mission of these centers is really to end hunger by 2030 through providing science on food, land and water systems. So we're doing a lot of research in different areas and then we're kind of presenting this research and we're also, um, we're doing a lot of policy advocacy to kind of ensure that this research is also being applied. So we're not a university, it's not enough for us to just publish and that's it. We're working a lot with governments, with ministries, with uh, UN agencies, humanitarian agencies to ensure that the science that we're building on this topic is actually being taken up by somebody. So the team uh, that I work for is called the Focus Climate Security Team, which is actually a really fun team. We're 50 people working across 16 different countries, and we're working specifically on the topic of climate security. So this is a group of uh, mostly young researchers who are um, covering all sorts, of, uh, all sorts of different scientific methods. So we have qualitative researchers, we have uh, GIS people, we have people doing econometric analysis, quantitative research. So we're putting all of these different methodologies together to kind of address the, the topic of climate security from multiple different angles. Um, so can I ask you, so climate security, I'm not sure if this is a term that you guys have come, come across before. It's becoming more and more popular or more kind of well-known over the past few years. But how does it, I mean, climate change, climate security, does anyone have any ideas or like, why would it be different? How would climate security be different from climate change? Any, any, anything that comes to mind? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay, so mitigating to protect people against climate-related risks. Um, I mean, because the word security isn't there, I can imagine that climate security also is, is a field in which, like, uh, like, like, the forces of security are interested in to see, like, how uh, the, the situation changes when, like, climate change gets, gets worse, like how that Yes, yeah, so also political kind of uh, security interests are being affected by climate change, yeah? It's not related to what Max just said, but uh, a very important dimension of climate change also has to do with um, climate conflict and climate-related um, border disputes as well and migration. Right. Uh, all of which can be potential issues of security concern for a lot of countries. Right. Um, and so climate security could have something to do with ensuring 
um, that the judge has treated the property and we study it and we can actually do something about this. Right. So also to the climate. So the impact of climate on border disputes, on conflicts, on migration, which is already by definition often kind of an international process. Um, at the back, I don't know if you wanted to add something that's saying the same thing. Um, I think you've, you've already actually covered a lot of the things uh, that the climate security definition entails. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about this in a minute. Um, then I want to talk a little bit about the Arab region and why climate security would be specifically important in the Arab region. Um, then how we can integrate something like climate security into policies and programming. I mean, how can you actually do climate security on the ground? Uh, and then I'll present a few examples from the field. Uh, we've, I've just returned from Jordan, where we've carried out some research on climate security, migration, conflict in a couple of villages. So we're still kind of analyzing the research. We've only just finished the data collection, but I'm, I'm going to present like a few first uh, kind of, you know, thematic uh, strands that are coming out of this, this research analysis. So climate security has been defined differently and actually uh, there isn't one definition that is accepted by everyone yet. So this is a term that's still very much in flux, it's still, still very much defined by the people who are working in this, you know, in this area. Uh, you can see the UNDP definition from, that was just a very recent definition from September. It's quite short and quite limited, so it refers to the impact of climate crisis on peace and security, full stop specifically in fragile and conflict-affected settings. There's also much longer definitions that are talking about uh, climate change impacts on ecosystems, on socioeconomic development, uh, on political stability, um, and the multiple threats really on human security. Uh, all the way from kind of, you know, humans, uh, societies, all the way towards states, and then state security. Oops. Um, at COP28 this year, I'm not sure if you guys were kind of following the COP uh, news a little bit from Dubai this year. So, uh, yeah, it was in the news. <laughs> um, so COP28, actually this year, for the very first time, there was a day at COP28 that was dedicated to climate, peace and security. So the day was called Climate, Relief, Recovery and Peace. So this whole connection between climate change and peace is being recognized a lot more internationally. And on that day in Dubai, there were lots and lots of events. Um, we also hosted a couple of events with our team. We had this pavilion at COP28, but there was a lot, a lot of discussions, a lot of seminars, panel discussions about this connection between climate, peace and security. So it is becoming something that is more and more kind of talked about. Um, and on that day, there was also an international um, declaration and in this declaration, they're also acknowledging that fragility in conflict will inc increase people's vulnerability. So it's obvious that if there's a conflict in a country, that it's, you know, people are suffering. And then if climate change is happening at the same time, you kind of get this, you know, inter like, interlinked issues on the ground uh, that are making kind of things worse for people. Uh, but it, climate change also affects livelihoods, infrastructure, water, human, human security, food, health, cultures. So there's a whole, you can see it's quite complicated. And there's all these different layers and, and definitions of security that are kind of interlinking with each other. But uh, we were very happy that actually the linkages are becoming more and more acknowledged because I think it's, it's something that we need to understand a lot better. So, um, Human security, so there's, you know, all these different aspects of human security. Water security is something that in the Arab region is one of our biggest issues. Uh, we're living in a very dry, arid climate. Uh, a lot of the countries are already water insecure. So as we are experiencing climate change, this situation will become worse. So, you know, we, we have a hotter climate, we have a drier climate. So in a, in a, in a region that is already struggling to access water, climate change is going to really have, uh, you know, like a, a big impact. So securing water, ensuring that people have food, uh, ensuring that livelihoods are secure, for example, in the agricultural sector. So farmers, you know, there's a lot of small farmers who are just struggling to get by. And now climate change is making their life even more difficult, you know, in terms of accessing water, in terms of 
ensuring there's a good crop every season. There's all of these seasonal changes and rainfalls. So we really have to look at this kind of human security angle. So it's not only about states and wars. Uh, it's also about people on the ground and their lives and their livelihoods. So it's a very, there's a lot of levels within there. So different levels and different types of security. Um, climate change can also reinforce existing conflicts and disputes. So where there's already a struggle going on, climate change can make it, and basically intensify it and make it worse. But also the other way around, uh, a conflict is also never good for climate change. If you look at, you know, the situation in Palestine, all of the bombing, I mean, it's not, of course, it's a huge human loss, but, but there's also, you know, like a, a bad effect on the climate. If you take it, you know, if you look at, so it goes both ways. So climate change has an impact on conflict, but conflict also has an impact on climate change. And if you have already fragile states that have dysfunctional governments, uh, dysfunctional institutions, it becomes very hard to react to climate change. So, you know, all the, the climate change uh, mitigation, adaptation, this is all really expensive for countries. So if you have a country that is functioning very well, that has like a good political system, that is kind of rich enough to pay for all of this, that's fine. But if you're in a country that is already fragile, that has, you know, malfunctioning institutions, that doesn't have enough money, how are these countries supposed to follow the climate goals that we formulated for the planet, you know, within the next couple of decades? So uh, in COP also, if you guys have been following this whole loss and damage discussion, you know, how do we really, how do richer countries help uh, poorer countries that are more affected by climate change finance all of this? You know, because the world's finance is not going to the most fragile states, unfortunately. And a lot of banks and financial institutions really don't want to invest, you know, in countries that are, you know, really corrupt and not functioning well. So this is a problem also that the finance is not going to those areas that are actually affected by security and fragility issues. Um, you also, in the def definitions about climate security, you, you often hear that climate change is a risk multiplier. So you already have risks, climate change is going to make them worse. This, this narrative is being transformed a little bit lately because it's actually a little bit too one directional. So it's not enough to say we have this risk and it's going to get worse. But things are a lot more complex when you look at them on the ground. So we're actually talking now more about compound risks. So risks that are enforcing each other, but not necessarily in the same direction, but that are quite complicated, interlinked. So it's a web of different risks and different processes. Um, and there are also these feedback loops. You know, things are making, you know, they're basically getting worse and reinforcing each other. So it's, it's quite a complicated context. Um, and we, we, we don't fully understand this yet. It's clear that we don't have enough research that is designed to understand this complex, these complex interactions. Because you, knew, you need to look at multiple different things at the same time. You have to have researchers from different backgrounds. You have to use different methodologies. So we're not grasping the situation enough um, as yet. And our institution, we're kind of trying to create more data, more evidence on the issue. So. Um, if you look at climate security effects on the ground, this is actually one of my colleagues has made this for, for Africa. Um, the interactions between different issues, you can see how messy and complex that gets. So you end up with these graphs where so many, there's so many interconnections between governance, between economy, society, culture, um, you know, climate risks, land use, land rights. Uh, so all of these different elements playing together. And what you can also already see is that with, if you are facing a situation like that, if you are a policymaker, you have to have policies that are able to address this mess. And this is another layer of problem that we have, mm -hmm. that our policies are often quite linear. You have different ministries working on different issues, but we don't really have policymakers, you know, being able to or, or having the right institutional capacity to address you know, this kind of messy or this interconnected risk. So um, what we're arguing is that climate change is not only exacerbating human insecurity, so making things worse, but there's also openings in there for uh, generating more peace. 
if we talk about um, politics, about food, land and water systems, if you're trying to transform those, they can actually work the other way around. You can actually try to promote more peace by transforming or by at least supporting some transformations of, of these systems. Uh, okay, I hope I haven't overwhelmed you already. <laughs> so is this, I mean, you can see that climate security is a bit different from just talking about climate change, right? So it's not just about these, you know, the, 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 the usual climate risks that we hear about. It's this really messy kind of inter, intersection of risks on the ground that are affecting not only states, but also humans and communities and livelihoods. So, you know, this, this is kind of the, the point I was trying to make. Um, so in this whole context, uh, what also becomes very interesting or very important is to define what do we mean by peace? I mean, what, you know, climate security. So we're trying to have peace. So what, what, what kind of peace? Um, has anyone ever heard about the different, like the dif distinction between positive and negative peace? Anyone? Uh, yes? Uh, um, uh, a negative peace would be just, uh, I mean, also on the slide, it would just be the absence of like violence that is happening right now, but a positive peace incorporates justice. Right. A situation can be peaceful without being just in any way. You know. Exactly. So peace really just means the absence of war, you know. Uh, so you say if there's no war in a country or no armed conflict, there's peace. But that's not actually enough. So there was a scholar in the 1960s, Johann Galtung, whose readings are still being used today and, and, and he's still being cited within this context of, of climate security. Um, and he said that peace, positive peace really goes beyond that. So uh, it's really the attitudes, institutions, structures that, that create a peace that, is, that can be sustained. So it's about the absence of structural violence. So structural violence, for example, entails that um, a state system uh, that cannot guarantee equal access to resources, for example, right? You said uh, justice. So we have to really look at institutions, we have to look at society, we have to look at the private sector. So it's not only the states and an army, you know, that is ensuring that there's actually peace in a country, but you have to look at institutions, you have to look at so social structures, uh, inequalities, gender inequality. Uh, so it, it becomes, you know, much more complicated and has a lot, a lot more layers. Uh, so when we talk about peace, what we really want is positive peace, not just negative peace. So it's not enough to look at states and armies. We have to really dig deeper and look at all of the structural inequalities that, for example, are responsible for people in a community not having equal access to water or to food or to electricity uh, or to education or to uh, careers and you know, also gender, for example, gender inequalities. So bringing in all of these layers again makes things quite complicated and you can see why, you know, these methodologies that are looking all at all of these different aspects become, um, become really important. Um, and now looking a little bit more at food, land and water systems. So food, land and water systems are really central to a lot of these issues that I've been talking about. Because if you look at, for example, the Arab region where I work, a lot of farmers are very immediately connected to the land. So, you know, if you, if you think about, for example, agriculture livelihoods, uh, the impact of climate change becomes very direct. Maybe you've heard before that people who are, whose livelihoods are directly depending on environment and ecosystem, are much more impacted, immediately impacted by climate change than a lot of us might be, right? So if the temperature goes up a little bit, okay, we, we might be in a city, we're a little bit hot, we're turning on the air conditioning. Um, if it rains a little bit more one year, oh well, it rains a bit more. So we're not, maybe not directly affected, but farmers or fishermen or people whose livelihoods depend directly on, on, the, on ecosystems, they really feel the impact, right? So if if one year you have a lot of heat or you have drought and you're losing most of your harvest and you're a small farmer, it directly impacts your, your income, your livelihood, your well-being. So our argument with, uh, within the, the team that I work in is that these food, land and water systems are really central to peace. Because if we ensure that there is more justice 
you know, in terms of access to water, access to resources, in terms of food security, water security, then this can actually be a pathway to more positive peace. Uh, and this is why in our research we focus a lot on these food and land, food, land and water systems because we think that's a very central element to, to having positive peace. Okay, let me ask you this one too. <laughs> so, okay, we've talked about climate security as kind of like uh, a term or a concept. Uh, can we also be climate secure? Do you think, I mean, we, if you talk about water security or food security, there actually is a definition, you know, of when, when you are water secure. Uh, the water security, like for example, water scarcity threshold is like a thousand cubic meters per person per year, becomes quite a defined concept, right? What about climate security? I mean, is there, can there be a state where we're actually climate secure? And what would that, can you imagine what that could, I mean, what could that mean if you're a government or a decision maker? I mean, what would you have to do to make sure that you are climate secure? Okay, so the system has to be flexible enough to adjust to the to the fast, you know, changes or processes that climate change is, is causing. Yep. Um, may, may I just add to that in my head, the, the closest thing that a government or society get, could get to being climate secure would be actually to mitigate climate change, to actually fix what we have broken. So you all know and have heard many times this mm -hmm. Yeah, so mitigation, of course, is like a central issue. The problem also is, though, that it's a global problem, right? So, so even if you're mitigating in France, you know, in other parts of the globe, they might actually feel impacts that they're not even causing themselves, right? And this is, I think this is like the, the inherent inequality with, with climate change is that the countries that are causing the most emissions are not the ones that are most affected, right? So the, these islands in the Pacific that are being entirely flooded or very small countries that are causing almost no emissions are the ones that are actually most vulnerable. So mitigation, of course, has to happen, that's for sure. But often the countries you know, that are mitigating, they might not actually feel the impact immediately. I think this is the, one of the issues. Yes? Um, I, would, uh, I would just say something that's very different from mitigation. Um, I was asking, well, what about um, um, forecasting? Mm -hmm. So achieving climate security through the ability of being better at predicting the unpredictable climate, therefore reducing insecurity, reducing insecurity through Reducing, reducing risk through, through security. Yeah, so forecasting, early warning systems. I mean, this is something that I cop, you know, everywhere. We need better early warning sy systems. We need to make sure all countries have them, right? That we have the data to know what's going to happen, when it's going to happen. If you're prepared, then you can actually react, right? Uh, adaptation, you know, we have to be better at adapting. But what about all of these other things we've just mentioned, like social issues, uh, livelihoods, economy, I think maybe the climate security is also about forecasted. So people they have lost, uh, they don't lose their livelihoods or their homes mm -hmm. during these events because during extreme floods, lots of people they lose not only their livelihood but like their houses, their mm -hmm. family, like history there. So right. So it's also about forecasting because these populations are also more fragile and vulnerable to this kind of uh, climate dynamic. Right. Forecasting, but then also basing your planning on that. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, right now what's happening a lot in the region where I work, uh, Saudi Arabia, for example, are really replanning their infrastructure because they're preparing for more drought, but also for more floods. And all of the, the roads like in Cairo, where I live, when it rains in Cairo, everything gets flooded. Like our infrastructure is not made for rain at all. Like, you know, it rains for half an hour and the whole entire road is flooded. There's no drainage. So all of these countries are now actually reorganizing the infrastructure because they have to expect like, you know, sudden freak rain events. Overall, we're expecting more drought, but there might be, you know, sudden extreme weather events that actually cause a lot of damage. 
So knowing where the damage is going to happen and then planning for it and, and making sure that your infrastructure or where your people live or your cities are actually planned accordingly. What about, yeah? Is that comprehensive? Social security uh, programs have to be, have to recognize that climate change is happening? Like, exactly. <laughs> people should not have to go to work on construction sites during heat waves. So mm -hmm. there is in, at least in, my, in, in India, there is no recognition of this in the social security programs that are already existing. Exactly. Social security, social protection. I mean, this is something I work on a lot and it's like a passion for me, but uh, social, the whole social protection um, kind of approach is not really looking at climate change as a risk factor yet. Right. So and, and we will need a lot more. Like what about small farmers who lose their farms? I've, I've seen a lot of farmers in, in, in Jordan, for example, who there's droughts over many years and then farmers are selling their animals. So somebody who had a herd of like 50 sheep has sold half the sheep because they can't they don't have food for them. Right. It's too dry. The rains are not coming. They're coming too late. So what 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 does somebody like that do, who, like that do? You know, what, what, what sort of social protection do we have to provide? for people who are losing their livelihoods like that, or people who are working on construction sites and cities. I mean, a lot of, you know, the, con like, the livelihoods are going to change because of climate change. So we have to help people adapt. You know, what does a farmer like that need who's lost half his herd? And this is part of the research we're doing. We're asking people, what do you need to adapt to climate change? Is it more social security? Is it uh, you know uh, agricultural assistance programs? Is it knowledge? Is it tech? Like is it access to technology? Is it what? What do you need? You know, and I think that policymakers don't base their decisions enough on on this kind of local knowledge to really design the social protection programs because we have to really rethink. Um, and at the same time, also social vulnerability has to be more of a part of climate change. You know, climate climate change adaptation, for example. I've worked for two years on a program where we really try to bring social indicators into climate risk assessment. Um, so not only uh, unemployment and, and, and poverty, but also gender, um, health, disabilities, uh, um, refugee status, you know, all of these should be indicators. I mean, they make you more vulnerable to climate change because there's this intersectionality of risk. But climate risk assessments are still very much based on you know, natural science indicators. So bringing, like pushing the social in there is something that has, you know, has been quite, quite hard. But uh, yeah, so what governments have to do to become more climate secure is to make sure that they have the ecosystems, the policies, the institutions, the social systems in place that make sure that this climate change impact is not going to really throw people or like into into situations of human insecurity of livelihood insecurity of unemployment of food insecurity of water insecurity so as a government you have to cover you know a lot of different like a lot of ground in a lot of different areas to ensure that climate change is not going to have such a disruptive effect on on your population so the the problem is really complex and it needs really complex government responses and the problem that we're seeing specifically in the region and the Arab region is that governments are not really working together. So if you if you're looking at a government like you have like a <clears throat> we do a lot of these kind of uh, workshops with different representatives from different ministries. Right. So you can see they're not working together at all. You know, if you look at the, the list of problems that we've just listed together, you'd have the Ministry of Water, the Ministry of Agriculture, the Ministry of Social Development, uh, migration, um, urban development. I mean, there's, you know, it depends on the government what the ministries are called, but all these ministries should be sitting together around the same table and coming up with a solution that can really provide, you know, the complexity of, you know, that we need. And that's really not, I mean, they're not exchanging data. They're not talking to each other. Uh, there might be some sort of working group, you know, representatives from different ministries discussing the topic together. But the implementation, the policy implementation on the ground, this is not happening as a multi-ministerial uh, process. Also on the ground, I mean, how do multiple ministries together implement a program on the ground? How do they manage or share budgets? You know, the budgets are all like every ministry has their own budget. How do we bring that together and, and come up with a solution that is complex enough 
so it can really help people. Um, this is something that is very challenging and we're working on it in a lot of different countries and trying to really push governments to kind of understand the complexity of this, right? And to ensure that our government responses or governance responses are, are complex enough to, to, to work against this. And this also has to go around the whole policy cycle. So the development of the agenda, the formulation of the policy, the implementation of the policy, the monitoring of the policy. So integrating all of this into the policy cycle on the ground needs a lot of work um, and a lot of science also, and a lot of tools that people can really use on the ground. So it's, you know, policymakers often say, okay, we understand what you're saying about climate change, but how do we do this? How, if, like I'm sitting at my desk, desk every day, how do I implement climate change on the ground? So we need a lot more tangible tools, methods that governments can use, uh, checklists, you know, what do, what do I have to even consider if I'm, de if I'm designing a policy? You know, what, what are the angles I have to bring into this? Who are the experts I have to, uh, have to talk to? What is the data that I need? So um, our team, we actually, this is something that has just been launched this year. It's called uh, the, the Climate Security Observatory. So we've made this open access kind of data portal that is bringing together all the data on climate risk and all the data on peace and security. Um, and policymakers get these interactive maps, you know, they can see if they're designing a program or a policy, how do, you know, how, how does climate security come into this? But based on a number of different indicators together. So um, I think, you know, these multi-indicator ind indexes are actually something that are going to be very helpful in the future. You talked about data and forecasting. I think this is, you know, we need these tools that are bringing different types of data together. So we're designing all these kinds of tools and then we're trying to get governments to use them. I mean, it's all free. It's all, you know, we're trying to really shape this in a way so people can use it and it's meaningful on the ground. Uh, so this is one, one tool that we have. We also have tools where you can assess whether a project that you've implemented has been climate secure, ha has been positive for climate security or not. You know, this is kind of an evaluation tool. We also have investment plans, we have a governance toolkit, we have an index that you can use. So we're trying to come up with more and more of these kind of practical tools that, you know, can really help governments do this on the ground. Uh, has this been clear so far, kind of the concept of, are there any questions about this or, yeah? <laughs> Um, okay, so maybe then we can talk a little bit more about uh, the Arab region. So um, I'm personally based in Egypt and I have been for 17 years. I'm really happy there. It's, it's not an easy country, uh, as David was saying. <laughs> um, I live in Cairo, which is like super crowded, more than 20 million people, you know, very polluted, very loud. Um, but it's also a very interesting country where a lot of things are happening. And if you're working in, in, in this kind of area, there's a lot to do, you know, in terms of water management, resource management. We have a lot of challenges uh, in Egypt, um, you know, population growth, water insecurity. Uh, so a lot of things have to happen quite fast. Um, and, but I also work in other countries in the region. So we've just uh, carried out some research in, in Jordan. Um, we, we, we work with different countries across, across the, the Arab region. Um, today I'm going to talk about Jordan because this is the country I've just come back from. Has anyone been to Jordan? Or is from Jordan? Yep. <laughs> Where did you go in Jordan? Uh, I, I did everywhere. Everywhere? Cool. <laughs> cool. Yeah. Very cool. Uh, so you might recognize some of these, uh, <laughs> some of these places. So um, the Arab region is actually a region that is specifically vulnerable to climate change. We're already, you know, we have we're measuring a lot of impacts already. So this is the thing with climate change, you know. It, it used to seem like it's something that's going to happen sometime in the future, but we actually, you know, if you're measuring the data between the 60s and now, it's already there. It's already measurable, right? So what we're already measuring and what's also coming up in a lot of the, the, the projections is that we're going to have hotter temperatures, we're going to have heat waves, we're going to have more drought, we're going to have more extreme weather, like you were saying, um, you know, hot periods, but also dust storms. We have a lot of dust storms in the region, of course flash floods, floods, um, and then of course sea level rise is something that specifically in Egypt is an issue with the, the delta being really low. Um, and in, in the Arab region, this is not good 
because we're already suffering from a lot of other problems. So 18 out of the 22 Arab countries are already water scarce and 13 are below the absolute water scarcity threshold, which is 500 cubic uh, meters per person per year. Uh, so 1,000 is water scarce, like water scarce, 500 is extreme, and a country like Jordan has 70. So if you, uh, do you remember in Jordan how often you had water every week? Or maybe you were not affected so much in the tourism industry sometimes. <laughs> um, but in Jordan, if you live in, in Amman, you have water once a week for two hours. That's when water comes out of your tap. Then you have to make sure that you fill your tank up on the roof. And if you run out for the week, you, know, you have to go and buy from a truck. So it's really you know, extreme. And Jordan, I mean, this is the way this, the, the region is going. So in, in, in Egypt, you don't feel it like this yet because we have the Nile. So people who live in Cairo have no concept that we have water scarcity. Of course, farmers are starting to feel this, but I think eventually we're going to end up like Jordan, you know, because we have such a, such a fast population growth that the availability of water divided by population, so per person, you know, that just goes down, down, down. So this water scarcity is really having an impact. In a country like Egypt, 80% of the water is going to agriculture. So you can imagine like, you know, having less water that there's a lot of jobs affected, a lot of income, uh, food security is immediately affected. So, uh, and already in the region, we only have 5% of the land that can even be farmed. That's arable. So most of the region is a desert. Um, a lot of countries are importing a lot of food already. Uh, Egypt is importing 60% of its food. Jordan is importing, I think, 90% of it, like even more. So the Gulf countries are, you know, importing almost everything. So it's not a region that is very productive in terms of agriculture. And insecurity, food insecurity is going up everywhere across the region. So you can see that with these existing problems, climate change is just going to make everything worse. Uh, I'm going to show you some very quickly. I'm, I'm not an expert in this, so please don't ask me very detailed questions. <laughs> I got this from a climate guy, but these are the projections for the region. Um, they're always done for two different scenarios. You might be, you know, from the IPCC reports, you might have seen these scenarios. Uh, the 4.5 scenario is an intermediate scenario, and then 8.5 is the, the worst, case, like, worst case. So this is always intermediate, this is worst case. These are, this is the mean annual change in temperature for the region. So if you have a medium case, you can see it's going to go up a few degrees. Uh, in, the, in the worst case scenario, it's going to go up several degrees. So you can see you know, by the end of the century, the region, a lot of Africa actually starts being, being very, very red. Um, so you can see uh, for the 4.5, you have like, a, you know, in, in our region, kind of like a 2 to 3.5 degree increase. For 8.5, it's more like 5 or 6. So that's, that's a lot for a region. Uh, rainfall is also changing. So if you look at the rainfall projections, um, oh no, sorry, let's go to the hot day. This is the number of hot days. So this is also what's happening a lot that in the summer, there's more and more hot days, right? So like farmers are really complaining uh, in the summer months, you know, because suddenly there, we have days that are well over 40 degrees and a lot more than they used to be. So you can see the number of very, very hot days over 40 degrees actually goes up. So if it was kind of, around 20, it might end up being like 40, 50, 60, depending on where you're looking at. So summer temperature is something that in the region is going to become a very big problem. And rainfalls are going down. So we're looking at more drought in the region overall, while we're going to have some freak rain events. So I've lived in Cairo for 17 years. I have to say that I think it feels like it, there's stronger rain now than there used to be. Like when it rained, in 2006, 7, 8, it was like, you know, drop, dry, like drizzle. It wasn't like coming from Germany. I, was, I wouldn't say that that's rain. <laughs> um, but now we sometimes have thunderstorms. We have actual big rain events, but only for a day. You know, this is not water that the country can use in any way. It's not filling up any tanks. Uh, maybe we should start, you know, harvesting this water more. But overall, in the, in the water budget of the country, this is not not even counted. This is not helping, you know, farmers or anyone. So we have to actually prepare for less, you know, less rain. So um, on top of that, 
we have some other issues in the Arab region that are making things uh, worse. We are very dependent on agriculture in a lot of countries. Uh, in Egypt, it's like 20% you know, of the workforce is working in agriculture. Um, we have a lot of displacement. We have a lot of ongoing conflicts right now, actually 45 armed conflicts in the region. So if you think about you know, uh, Libya, Syria, Palestine, Yemen, so you have a lot of you know, crises in the region that are ongoing and that also have been ongoing for many years. So the Syria conflict you know, has been, you know, the refugees have been displaced for like 12 years or more. Palestine, you have people who've been displaced for decades. So a problem that we have in the region are these protracted, we call them protracted crises. They're like ongoing, really long crises that don't seem to be ending. Um, and this is causing a lot of uh, displacement and mobility. So there's so many refugees, you know, in the region, but then also, of course, also outside the region. Um, but it's something that, you know, if you have a country that's already struggling with water scarcity, then also accepting refugees, of course, that's not going to make things, you know, better either. And like I said, climate finance doesn't really arrive in a lot of the places in the region that really need more finance. So nobody wants to fund a, a country like Yemen, a country like Libya, you know, uh, specifically banks, because it's, you know, securities are really not there. So there's a lot of things in the region that are kind of coming together that are making things worse. So um, I've, I've been working, this is now the, the part about Jordan. <laughs> So we've been working in Jordan recently uh, on an initiative that's called Fragility, Conflict and Migration. So we're trying to put these different elements together and research them on the ground. So in Jordan, this means how are communities that are already struggling with water scarcity and climate change dealing with refugees coming into the community? How are they generating peaceful livelihoods together? How are they sharing resources? How are they um, building livelihoods together? Um, and what are the problems there? And then also how can humanitarian programs, so, so the programs that are helping the refugees, how can they be transitioning from something that is emergency short term towards long term assistance? Because now, like I said, refugees have been there for 10 years and more, you know, uh, they're still getting cash transfers from UNHCR every day. They still don't really have a long term livelihood in the country. How do I transition this? How do I make sure we call this the HDP nexus? humanitarian development peace nexus. So we've been looking at these issues kind of on the ground uh, in Jordan. So Jordan is actually a fairly small country, like Egypt has more than 100 million people, Jordan has 11.3. But out of those, almost 3 million are refugees. So we have 2 million Palestinian refugees living in Jordan, 760,000 Syrians, these are the officially recognized ones. And then specifically for the Syrians, there's like an estimated 1.3 additional unregistered refu uh, refugees. So um, Jordan has accepted a lot of refugees. You can see this actually is one of Jordan's biggest refugee camps, Azraq camp. This is in the middle of the desert. It's been there for a decade or more than a decade. Uh, and you can see people are living in these tents, like tents and, and caravans. And this is their livelihood for years and years and years. So this is not a short emergency situation. This has become like a city, right? They have now solar systems. They have jo people are working. They give them jobs. They're unpaid kind of volunteer jobs. But this is like, if you look at it, it's huge. It, it looks like a city. Um, but actually, most refugees are living outside such camps. So they're living in communities. And communities that are already struggling to access water, for example, to have food security are now accommodating a lot of refugees coming in. And the question then is, how do these communities deal with this? Like, is this causing issues, tensions? Are they, how are they integrating the refugees? What are the livelihoods of the refugees? Are they sharing resources? So, you know, these are the kind of research questions we had. Um, and there's also a lot of migrants, of course, in Jordan. So people who come in to find jobs, for example, in the, in the agricultural sector. You know, a lot of Egyptians are working on farms. So there's like a mix of different generations of refugees, different types of, you know, forcefully displaced migrants who actually chose to come there. So lots of different groups kind of living together. Um, like I said, Jordan's already one of the most water scarce countries on the planet. 
Um, there's a lot of transboundary water. If you look at the Jordan River, for example, right? There's like different countries sharing the water from the same river. This is a lot of political, you know, issues like who gets how much. So in the region, you have a lot of transboundary water access for rivers, but also for groundwater. So you have shared aquifers. Several countries have to share that water, and they have to negotiate. Who, you know, maybe you heard about this uh, almost conflict between Egypt and Ethiopia when Ethiopia was building this new dam. So this almost, you know, there was a lot of threatening uh, narratives and, you know, that, I mean, this is already, I mean, this, I think in the region, we could probably have to expect more of this kind of conflict around water access. Um, so the impacts I've already kind of mentioned, I mean, they're also valid for Jordan. Droughts, floods, flash, a lot of flash floods in Jordan recently because, you know, it's quite a hilly country. So when there's sudden rain and creates flash floods, um, and farmers are talking about more extreme temperatures, hot and cold, which are having really bad impact on, on the harvests. Uh, and I talked about the limited food production already. So where we worked, uh, we actually worked in two different locations. One location in the Jordan Valley here, and another location, Azraq Oasis was kind of, it's, it's more in the middle of the rangeland, so like a, more like a desert uh, landscape. Um, this is a map I produced uh, for a job, my previous job. <laughs> so I used to work for the UN before I joined CGIAR. And I worked in Jordan on another project for two years that was combining all of these indicators together. And based on, on, this, on 31 different indicators, we made this climate risk map. Uh, so this map is based on a lot more social indicators than our other maps are. So it's looking at also sensitivity, adaptive capacity, vulnerability. Um, and in the selection of our uh, fieldwork locations for this project, we, we wanted to look at some of these red areas. Um, but we, we wanted to compare also two different places. So we have one in the red zone and one somewhere here that is not red, but it has a lot of refugees. So we tried to kind of look at different angles. So looking at the map of Jordan, you can see one location is right here in the Jordan Valley. It's the Rift Valley. You can have, uh, you have Lake Tiberias, then you have Syria. Uh, Israel, Lebanon, right there. Um, this is much greener, and this is kind of, I mean, Jordan doesn't, compared to Egypt, Jordan doesn't produce a lot of food. But when you talk about agriculture, this is where most of the agriculture production is happening. Um, so this is much greener, they have more access to water, there's also more rain in this part of Jordan. Um, Azraq uh, is way over in the desert, so this is, these are the rangelands, they get less than 200 millimeters of water per year. And you can see it's got this, this basalt, it's this black desert it's coming from you know, lots of basalt rocks around. Uh, it's also very close to Saudi Arabia and to Iraq. Uh, there's a lot of drug traffic going through there. It's kind of on this main drug traffic route from Syria to the Gulf states. Uh, so drug issues are getting worse. As people are losing their livelihoods, they're also transitioning into more kind of illegal livelihood options, which is another security problem. Um, so, oops, sorry. So what we did is we, uh, between October and December, we carried out some research in communities. So we interviewed, uh, in these two locations, we interviewed 30 people in each location. And then we had community focus groups, we had a workshop, um, and we also did some kind of participatory stuff, uh, specifically because we had a gender, strong gender component. We did this power walk where people do a role play, you know, where they're playing a different character and then they have to move backwards and forwards. Um, the good thing about this is that you can open up discussions about gender inequality in a, in a playful way. So people move back and forth and they see inequalities without having to really state, you know, sometimes people in this culture are not talking about gender very, very openly. <laughs> Um, so what we found in Azraq, Azraq is really this oasis. It's an oasis that has some agriculture production, but also a lot of live, uh, livestock. So that people have lots of kind of camels, uh, goats, some sheep. There's a lot of Bedouins in the area, different Bedouin tribes, and the Bedouins are doing a lot of this kind of, of herding. Azraq used to have, um, it's kind of this floodplain, and uh, they, have, uh, salt, they have a salty aquifer. And they used to mine, so there used to be a big salt mine 
that closed down and then lots of people got unemployed and a lot of people we were talking to were saying we need to revive the salt harvesting because the salt har like the lack of salt harvesting is also making the water more salty so farmers are complaining that because people are not harvesting the salt uh, this is i mean uh, i don't know you can <laughs> Uh, this is what people were saying. Uh, it was actually uh, making the, aqua, the water, the local water, more salty in some places, so it had some negative impact on the uh, on agriculture. So um, there were lots and lots of different refugees here. So you have Druze, it's quite an interesting religious uh, group. Um, you have uh, we had Syrians, Iraqis. There were even Chechens, you know, from the Chech uh, Chech uh, Chechnya crisis, uh, Iraqis. Um, so a lot of, you know, in Azraq we found that people were kind of used to living together and sharing livelihoods together. There were lots and lots of Syrians that were working um, mainly, so Syrians are allowed to work in the agricultural sector and in restaurants and construction, some very limited uh, fields. Um, and also they need to have a special permit, but they're not allowed to buy land, they're not allowed to start a company. Um, but then often they still kind of find their way. So they're starting a company with a Jordanian friend or they're buying land, but you know, somebody else is buying it for them. So people, because they've been there for so long, they have already created livelihoods for themselves to some extent. But people were really complaining, um, uh, even though like things were mainly peaceful, but uh, people, the, the Jordanians were saying, well, the, the, the Syrians are putting more pressure on our water they're making things more expensive, rents are more expensive, um, food is more expensive, uh, the public services are not fun functioning, we have too many people, right? So, so, so garbage collection, water, you know, this was not working as well. And then they were all saying, uh, the, the Syrians are getting all of these cash transfers from UNHCR, from WFP, from these UN organizations, and they're still working in the agricultural sector and they can accept much lower wages because they're a big family, they're all working and they're getting cash transfers. So the Jordanians were saying they're destroying the agricultural job market. And specifically the people who were losing their farms, they were looking for work in, agricult in the agricultural sector and then the Syrians basically had flooded the, that, that you know, kind of job market. So this was causing some, you know, people were going like, this is not fair and this, you know, the Syrians are really undermining our, you know, our labor market. This was causing some, some, some issues. So you can see that people were saying Syrians have had a big impact on the community. There's pressure on prices, housing, more competition. Um, there are overall less working opportunities. And people were talking about security. So now they had to lock their doors and there were more people doing drugs. So, I mean, there was some kind of mentioning of, of security issues or of kind of negative impact on the community. Um, uh, the North Shuna, this is the Jor Jordan Valley location, was quite different because in Azraq, you have, like I said, you have a lot of refugees. Um, in North Shuna, you're actually very, very close to the Israeli border. So in that border area, refugees are not allowed to live or to settle or to work. So this is actually a community that had a lot less refugees, but more migrants. So more labor, Egyptian labor migrants. Um, in this area, people are growing tree, like trees, there's like fruit, uh, fruit trees, lots of um, oranges, and then also dates and things like that. But then also vegetables and, and people have more water there, right? There's like, even though the Jordan River is difficult to access and most farmers were actually not getting water from the Jordan River, but from dams around, but there's more rain. And even in the winter months, people don't have to irrigate at all. Um, so there's more farming, more farms. And what we found is that um, most, most Jordanians didn't want to work in the agricultural sector there. You know, they were the farm owners and the Egyptians were doing all of the labor. So there were Egyptians, but also um, Pakistanis, Bangladeshis. They were doing all the agricultural labor, but they were not directly competing. So this was not creating such a big tension as in Azraq because people didn't want the same jobs, right? So in Azraq, we, we, it was all this job discussion. Here, it was more like, oh, we're glad the Egyptians are here because they're doing a really good job with the farms kind of thing. Um, and we didn't have um, as many Syrian refugees here. Um, but they were also talking about drugs and theft and unemployment and youth couldn't find enough kind of work engagements. Um, so the, these two places, as you can see, are quite different. But we found, uh, and of course, in terms of the migrant uh, question, they were, they were different and we found different issues. 
But there were also a lot of similar issues in that um, the respondents were saying we need more development, we have to move away from the kind of short-term cash transfer system towards more longer-term livelihood support, we need more development, we need to have value added, we need to base our development more on what the people need. They were all saying, you know, um, nobody's asking us what we want, or if they ask, they come in and do a focus group and then they go away and do what they want anyway. Um, so, you know, people were complaining that there wasn't enough in development investment in the area so they could really find enough jobs. Um, so what's, what was interesting is that I, I think the community members were actually able to find their way through the crisis. So they, you know, they were able to uh, create some livelihoods informally, formally, but it was mainly peaceful. But what was causing the issue was the, these cash transfers, right? Which is actually a humanitarian aid, which is useful and needed. But the way it was organized, you know, if you give one group cash transfers, transfers, transfers and the other group not, you know, there's going to be some. And this is where designing for peace comes, like, becomes important, right? So if you make a peace positive system, you have to consider how these different groups are working together as you're designing your program. Because otherwise you might do something that is helpful for climate change or for social security, but not for peace, right? So I think these are really interesting examples of why peace matters on the ground or why considering positive peace in the design of your solution has to you know, come in from the very beginning. So um, I'm almost at the end. <laughs> um, so what's, method, like what's being discussed a lot in Jordan, we talked a lot also to UN agencies, to government. Um, there's a big debate about what to do with these refugees that have been there for such a long time, specifically in the context of climate change and all of this. So the problem now is that these refugees are getting emergency payments you know, after 10, 12 years in the country. And the Jordanian government honestly doesn't really want them to stay. Right? So they're making it hard. They're actually rolling back the cash transfers. Um, they're making it, they're limiting what people can do because they're, they're scared that if they're opening up the job market, all the Syrians are going to stay in Jordan. Right? And they're saying we cannot handle this, you know, this number of refugees. So all of the Jordanian policies are kind of more geared towards not letting the people in long term, uh, not as full members of the society. Um, and the humanitarian agencies are saying, well, how can we transition from something short term to something long term if we don't have the political will to actually you know if people cannot open a, a company or buy a piece of land how are they what are they going to do long term in Jordan so it's actually an interesting uh, issue kind of you have po political will you have different organizations you have funding streams so how can you transfer from short term to long term support in this kind of scenario I mean this is also something we can discuss but it was quite an interesting debate. I mean, what do you do with these migrants that are there for so, like, you know, refugees that, that are there for such a long time? <clears throat> and how can you make sure that they, uh, you know, you can generate climate resilient livelihoods, you know, with these mixed groups of people? So if you look at some of the quotes, I mean, all the people was kind of saying, give us a fishing rod instead of giving us a fish. We want more uh, longer term support. Um, also give us the right kind of projects, the projects that we want, include local organizations more. Um, so they wanted a lot more economic entrepreneurial support, not these short term you know, payments. Um, there's GIZ, for example, they have a project in Jordan that's called Cash for Work. So refugees are employed for three months and they work in these kind of you know, uh, repairing dams, building roads. I mean, it's kind of public infrastructure which is also good for like climate resilience, but they're only employed for three months, then they leave again. So it's kind of, it's all kind of short term stuff. Um, and they were saying we want a long term career not, you know, not these small bits and pieces. Um, but then again, how can we do that if, if there's no kind of inclusive um, environment? Um, zooming out a little bit more, and this is my, the last point I want to make. Uh, so what do we do with all of this? What do we do in the region? You know, how do we implement climate security? We actually had this, um, this workshop with policymakers in Cairo in November, just before COP, to see what, what do people in the room really need in terms of climate security. Um, they were saying that um, a lot of the policies that are in place are not addressing climate security. They might be addressing climate change, but not climate security. 
Um, they were also saying there's not enough models and tools that are easy to use for policymakers that they can actually adapt. Um, and when we asked them what they need, they said, number one, the concept of climate security isn't understood well enough. So we need more, you know, we need more capacity, more knowledge about what that means. Um, we need also uh, kind of, you know, to understand more how we can integrate this into our you know, what, is it, what does it mean on the ground, basically, is, is what people wanted to know. Stronger partnerships, more funding, better understanding. Um, so, you know, this is, these are the kind of things that, that we're working on. Um, one thing that came out that was also quite interesting was desecuritizing the narrative. So there were quite a few experts who said the whole security narrative is not good in the region because it in immediately gets lumped in with, like, uh, military and you know state apparatus kind of so they said let's talk about peace rather than security so they wanted to bring like climate peace and security rather than climate security so even those narratives are kind of important you know to see what you can do in the region in some countries in the region you cannot use the term climate security because they say we don't have security issues so then we have to beat around the bush and be like resilience and peace and you know so it, it's a politically difficult term so there's, there's a whole list of things. I mean, I've mentioned a lot of them already. We've mentioned them together also. Um, these are the, like, the points that were um, agreed on in the declaration at COP about climate security globally. So more action, um, scaling up the financial resources, uh, making sure that the policies are conflict and peace sensitive, uh, making sure that the mandates of different governments are you know, combined, that they work together and have more partnerships. But uh, yeah, so I mean, this kind of data that we're collecting on the ground, like these stories from Jordan, it's really important to kind of base your, uh, your policies on that kind of knowledge, to understand what people need on the ground, you know, how can we make sure that our climate policy responses are locally relevant or make sense to local communities. Uh, that's it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.